My world is filled with cheer and you This Christmas And as I look around Your eyes outshine the town Sunday and welcome to City Life Church. Whether you're watching church online or you're here in person, we just want to say thank you for joining us. We are excited to worship with you today. If this is your first time with us, we would love to know. We have a super quick connect card for you to fill out. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you'll see the description tab at the top right corner of your screen. Click the link that says see more and in that section, a link for our first time viewer card will pop up. If you're joining us from church online, you'll see a banner on your screen right now that you can click to open up the Connect card. If you're with us in person today, would you text the word welcome to the number right here on your screen? A link will be sent to your cell phone for our digital Connect card. However, and wherever you're joining us today, would you please take a few moments to fill that card out? We would love to connect with you and thank you personally for visiting us here today at City Life Church. Now, if you're joining us from Church Online, here's a couple of quick tips for navigating your experience. As I just mentioned, if you're joining us by Facebook Live at your top right corner of the screen, there's a description tab. If you open that, you'll find links to your online giving, our City Life Kids online experience, all of our social media platforms, as well as a link to download our City Life app. If you're joining us through Church Online, all the items I just mentioned can be found by clicking the notes tab on the right hand of your screen. And if you're joining us in person, open the City Life app on your smartphone or tablet and you'll find today's message notes, online giving, and even a Bible if you forgot yours at home. 
Make sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms. And if you consider City Life Church your home, download the app. It's gonna give you access to all sorts of content and updates about what's going on right here at City Life Church. Now, if you're watching church online, you're also gonna see multiple banners or links popping up on your screen throughout the service. So make sure to keep an eye out for those. And please feel free to let us know how God is moving in your life. And if you need prayer for anything, we have a team waiting to hear prayer requests and stand in faith with you, believing that God is going to move mountains in your life. Thank you again for joining us here at City Life Church. We are excited to worship with you today. Now get ready, service is about to begin.
City Life. Anybody excited about the new year coming up? Oh, come on. I know it's 9 o'clock. It's the Sunday after Christmas. Can we just one more time just make a little bit more noise for Jesus today? Amen. It's so good seeing each and every one of you in the house, all of you that are worshiping with us online today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We pray that you had an amazing Christmas. Anybody you had a good Christmas this year? Santa Claus came to your house, visited, left maybe something good under the tree for you. And uh, Santa left a skateboard for my kid, and I'm still thanking him for that one. But, but it's so good seeing each and every one of you today. And we are just so excited for the new year, like I just said, and everything that's getting ready to come up in our New Year's Day service. And let me just say this. If you have not yet registered for our New Year's Day service, please go online and do that. You can do that on the website, um, on the City Life app, and it just helps us better prepare for you. But let me say this, just because you register to be at that service does not guarantee you a seat in the sanctuary. And so I encourage you to get here early, um, uh, get in line uh, to get yourself a great seat. Because again, just because you register does not guarantee you a seat in the sanctuary. It just helps us better prepare for you uh, so that we know exactly how many is going to be coming and all that good stuff, but it's going to be an exciting night. Dante Bo and is going to be with us, and it's just going to be an incredible time. And I encourage you to go online, maybe research some of his music if you've not yet heard him, and um, it's going to be an incredible time. But I want to uh, uh, welcome all of you today who are here for the very first time. If this is your first time in person or worshiping with us uh, on church online, thank you so much for being with us. If you would do us a favor real quick, on the screen behind me or in front of you, there is a number coming up. If you would text the word welcome to the number right there on your screen, we would love to connect with you. We're not going to spam you in any way, but there will be a link sent to your phone. If you would click on that link, fill out all the information in its entirety, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. If you're watching from church online, we would love to know how we can partner with you in prayer and and where you're watching from today. And so uh, do us a favor, if you're new, text the word welcome to the number right there on your screen. And if you are in person, as soon as service is over, if you would head to our guest reception area, which is located in our lobby, just outside the double doors behind you, we have some smiling faces that'll be behind some masks, but they would love to connect with you for just a moment and see how you like service. But again, welcome. City Life, can we just welcome all of our first time guests today? Amen. We're getting ready to take up our tithes and offerings today, and on the screen behind me, there are four ways for you to be able to give. You can sign right into your City Life app. You can text the giving. There is a secure giving envelope in the seat back in front of you. And if you're worshiping with us, church online, all of those options are available for you as well. Or if you would rather mail in your offering, you can do so by grabbing our address on the City Life app or website. And if you brought it in today physically, you can drop it off in the containers on your way out of service. But City Life, you have been so faithful in your your generosity and in your giving this entire year, even during a pandemic, even during the, the time that the buildings were closed, you were still faithful in your giving and you still made ministry happen. And it's just incredible to see everything that we've been able to do even during this Christmas season and the thousands of dollars that we were able to give away and the hundreds of children that on Christmas day woke up to presence under their Christmas tree, not because of a man in a red suit, but because of a church that was willing to give out of what God has blessed them with. And I was talking to a mom the other day, it was about two days before Christmas, and she was telling me that during the pandemic that her business was hit really hard and that she probably lost 60 to 70% of her income. And she said, it's just been a really rough year for me. And she said, the other week I told my kids, I'm really sorry, but mommy can't afford to get you any presents this year for Christmas. And she said, I felt bad. She started to tear up. I was tearing up. And she said, but then I got a phone call from City Life Church. And there was a voice on the other end that said, this year we want to help you and bless you. And we have some gift cards for you with your name on it, if you would come to the church. And she said, this year, City Life provided Christmas for my children. <laughs> City Life, it's all because of your giving and your generosity. And I just want to read a scripture in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. It says this, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. 
that when you give your generosity, City Life, it's making a difference. Your generosity is a, making a way for people to meet Jesus. But your generosity this year is being pleasing unto God. And so today as you get ready to give, give knowing that you're making a difference. But when you do, it's going to please the heart of God because of your faithfulness and your obedience. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for today. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to be able to give by faith and obedience of our tithes and of our offerings. God, knowing that when we give, Father, lives aren't just changed, but God, it pleases your heart. And so, Father, today as we give, Father, may we please your heart in our faithfulness, in our obedience. And God, that you would take our tithes and offerings, use it to further your kingdom, and we give you all the praise and glory. In your name we pray. And everybody said... I'm
hands together wherever you're at today. Come on, just tell him you believe he's turning it around. Come on, jump to your feet if you're in person. Come on, if you're in person today, jump to your feet today. We're going to pray here in just a moment. And uh, so excited about this season and what God has done. We pray you had a merry, merry Christmas full of God's blessings and just covered with prayer. We've been praying for you here at City Life and covering you. Excited about walking in here on two, uh, January 1st, 2021. How about to believe a reset's about to happen? Amen. A turnaround's about to take place. Anybody walking in, getting ready to take hold of your promise? We're going to come in here as we always do on January 1st. You know, it's an amazing night every year. And it's one of those nights you can't hardly get in the building or on the campus. And every year we walk in declaring over a new season in a new year. But I believe there's someone coming with a little more expectation this year. Coming with something in their spirit. Believing that even though God showed up and, and we look back at 2020 and see his arm and his hand at work. We're walking in believing that it's a new season. It's a new day. Believing by the word of God our best is yet to come. And we're excited. So you be here. As Pastor EJ says, go online and register. But just because you register doesn't mean you can roll in here 10 minutes late. Don't look at me like that because I know some of you roll in here about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Some of you roll in here while I'm preaching. And if you do that on New Year's Day, you may be in overflow. So be here early. It's going to be exciting. Dante Bo Maverick City Worship is going to be in the house. And we are so excited. God, every year gives us someone that celebrates with us. But the most important thing is Jesus is going to be in the house. So you show up, jump on church online. It's going to be an amazing 
As Pastor EJ said, thank you for your generosity. You helped us bless and cover hundreds and hundreds of children and people this Christmas season through your generosity. And you've been so faithful in 2020. In spite of everything we have faced, you have just pressed in and helped this ministry move forward day after day. So thank you for that. I am so excited today to have a special friend. He is a kingdom voice. He's a general of the faith. And me and Casey looked up to him and his wife long before we ever knew them. First of all, they were good-looking people. I mean, we just, from afar, they were always dressed to the nines. And they represented the kingdom well. They're a part of our tribe, our fellowship, the Church of God um, that we're connected to. And they were always a model of kingdom people, not denominational people, not people of one fellowship. But they were kingdom people. And that's what we strive to be. So they were a model and they were forerunners. They pastored him and his wife, Shirley Ann, pastored an amazing, pastor an amazing church in Toledo, Ohio. Been there 46 years. Are you thankful for faithfulness? And I am so honored to call him a friend. And I believe he's come with a word today. And uh, wherever you're at today, I know we have many, many that are watching, many more watching that are in this room. Matter of fact, jump on the chat. Let us know where you're at today, uh, wh where you're at, your home, a vacation, traveling. Let us know where you're at today. And we cover you and pray that the same anointing that's in this room just filters through airwaves and covers you and blesses you. And we can't wait to see you in this new year. But we're going to pray. And I want you to welcome my friend, Pastor Tony Scott, to City Life Church. Father, I am so thankful for the kingdom of God. I am thankful for friends in the kingdom, voices in the kingdom. And Father, I pray an anointing over Pastor Tony today. I thank you for his life, the life of Shirley Ann. I thank you for the church at Strayer, Father, and what they're doing in Toledo. I thank you for all of their campuses and that regional impact they are making and the thousands of people that are mobilized in that region for the kingdom and the gospel. I pray a new anointing and new favor over that house, over their ministry. And I pray that Pastor Tony delivers a word that's anointed, that is sharp, that changes the course of destiny today. Father, we bless you and give you all glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Would you welcome and say amen with Pastor Tony Scott today? Would you just give that hand to the Lord Jesus Christ? Come on, for Jesus, for his sake, his kingdom. I, I know you've stood a lot today, and I just am amazed at your energy after Christmas. You just seem like a group of people that are full of life and full of energy, and I like to be among people like that. How many of you would say that 2020 was somewhat challenging for you? Anybody? On August the 18th, My wife, Shirley Ann, left us to go into the presence of Jesus. 4.05 a.m. <clears throat> we were married for 55 years, and we were dating for three years. I met her when she was 15. That was about 10. <laughs> she was my life. She loved Jesus, and she loved me. And for the last four months, I've been a lost person, just wondering, trying to find a will to live, because she was everything to me. Whoever I am, whatever I am, she made me, Tony. She was the most unique person that I ever met in my whole life. I, I don't know if we have a picture for you, but I, I think the guys are, who are so good, this is her. <clears throat> and no, that's not when we were teenagers. That's only about 10 years ago. You can see what I look like without her. <clears throat> but she loved Jesus. She loved her family. And she loved what we call the church. 
And when she left, I thought I would die. I was in a daze. I'd get up every day and, and figure out how do I live today? Because she taught me so much about life. She's incredibly intelligent, witty, charming. She was a Southern belle. She had a smile that would light up a room. She never met a person she didn't like. She never met anyone she didn't think she could help. Every person she met, she thought she could help. And she would try. So I began to search the scriptures. I needed to know where she was. I have never, ever done a series of messages on heaven. I knew heaven was there. I knew God was going to take care of it. I was struggling enough to take care of earth. And I just didn't study heaven. I knew it was there. I'd mentioned heaven often. I know about the streets of gold and the gates of pearl. And I knew the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, a bride adorned for her husband. I knew all that stuff. I knew what Jesus said to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. I just didn't know what paradise was. So I I fell on my face and for four and a half months, I did nothing but study the word heaven. Heaven, heaven, heaven. I had to know where she was. I had to know what she was doing. And God began to speak to me. And although I'm not going to speak about heaven today, I thought I'd give you that tidbit in the hopes that someday in the future, Tony would invite me back to speak about heaven. (laughs) But I do want to talk to you about Christmas, and I know you've had enough of Christmas. But there's a story in the Bible, there's a sentence in the Bible that I think gets overlooked so often. Mostly it's just used at Christmas. Paul wrote it in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. In the fullness of time, when the proper time had come. Actually, why don't you just read it with me? But when the proper time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born subject to the regulations of the law. And then John, in his gospel, chapter 1 and verse 4, read with me. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Father, would you help me today to be an humble servant before you? And to let your voice come through me and speak to this people and give them hope. In Jesus' name, and amen. You may be seated. Life is full of time. Everybody say time. We have so many sayings about time. One of those sayings, obviously, is, is it everything? Is time, is timing everything? People will say that. Timing is everything. How many of you have heard somebody say that? Timing is everything. Then there are people who say, there's never a perfect time for anything. It's somewhere in between, either it's everything or there's never a perfect time for anything. When I look at the scriptures and I see this verse and it's mostly used at Christmas, very seldom will you find a message even online that comes from Galatians 4 and 4 other than at Christmas time. And yet the Bible says in the fullness of time, say fullness of times. So my question to God this Christmas season was, what does fullness of time mean? So if you sent your son in the fullness of time, how does that affect me? What does that mean for me? What was going on in the world that you decided when you looked down on the earth, this people need my presence physically? What made you, God, decide that you would inhabit a human body And you would walk among the people of the earth. How could that be and how could that happen? In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says to everything there is a season and a time for every matter or purpose under heaven. If we could just pause there for a moment and let that word speak to us. What What does it really mean that There is a time, there is a season for everything, for every purpose. Does that mean that there is a time and a season for my trial? 
Does that mean that there's a time and a season for my difficulty? Does that mean that there's a time and a season for my lack of understanding of God's ways? Over in Psalms chapter 103, the, the Bible says that God made known his ways to Moses. I've, I've read that scripture over and over and over, and I've, I've asked the Lord, help me to glean this. I, because it goes on to say, he made known his ways to Moses, he made known his acts to the children of Israel. So I want to know the difference between ways and acts. The word ways there is actually the word path. It's how God achieves something. And, 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 and Moses was one of those people that just had the heart of God. And God opened up the path so Moses could have something called understanding. Understanding is a very critical word in the Bible. The writer of, of writer Solomon was, was one of those wisest of all men. And, and, and Solomon said, in all of your getting, get understanding. How many of you have ever faced a situation in which you had no understanding? You said, Lord, I don't understand this. Anybody, anybody, I, I, I don't understand this. I, I, I didn't understand my wife leaving me. I still don't understand it. So I said, I'm going to get understanding. And, and then I thought, well, what is understanding? I mean, most people know those things. I'm, I'm one of those guys. i got to see it in writing. Show me what that means, God. And so I began to search the Hebrew word. What, what does understanding mean? Understanding means at the core of something where it originates. You begin to get insight into the what, why, and where. Of it, and so be, be like going into one of these keyboards. You you know the music, you hear the chords, you hear the keys, but inside of there, there's something that makes that happen. And I don't understand any of that. I I, I don't understand the difference between C and F. I, I mean, I hear the sound of it, but I don't know why one sounds this way and one sounds. I don't have understanding. And so it's insight. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have insight into some things in this life and just kind of grasp it and, and have a peace about that? I want, I want some understanding. And so I, I just begin to, to grapple with these things that I did not understand. God helped me, caused me to understand the times and the seasons of life. And then if you look at Job, in his gospel, Job chapter 14 and verse 14. He said, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait until my change comes. An appointed time. The fullness of times. When you go to Habakkuk, one of those minor prophets in the Old Testament, in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3, it just simply says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Time and it hastens to its fulfillment or its fullness. So we have this thought of an appointed time, a perfect time, the right time, the fullness of time. And in the fullness of time, the Bible said, God did this incredible thing. He sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. To inhabit flesh and to live among us. I don't know that if you search the scriptures, you would find a greater statement on time than this one statement. In the fullness of time. When time matured. So what does fullness mean? It means the exact time. It means the time of preparation had ended. It means that the full measure and abundance had come to fruition with an emphasis on completeness. Everything had been completed that God needed to see on the earth for him to send his son. And if you search the scriptures very carefully, you will see that there very possibly could have been three major reasons why God chose that precise moment. We don't even know what the date was. We'd say 2,000 years ago. We say December the 25th. Actually, neither of those are the case. It's just approximate. We think it happened about then. And when, and when I researched this many years ago, I was shocked to find out that more than likely it was around July. 
when he was born. But, but it doesn't matter. It's just we have a date, you see. We, we have a moment we can pause and say, Jesus came. And that's a very wonderful truth. And so, so it doesn't matter if it was December the 25th or 2,000 years ago. In the fullness of times, this, this was an exact moment chosen by God. Three reasons that I will give you very quickly. And the first one was that there was a one-world government at the time, Rome powerful nation, the most incredible military that the world had seen up until that moment, a rich nation, a powerful nation. And, and Rome was into building roads. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Middle East today, you can walk on some Roman roads that are still there to this day. That's how good they were at building roads. And they wanted all roads to lead to Rome. And surely they were accomplishing that. And so there was this one world government. Now, the flip side of that, or the negative side of, of, of the Roman government, is that it was very corrupt. As a matter of fact, it was very perverted. It was, it was sexually perverted. It was immoral to the core. It was so corrupt that the Israelite people cried out for God for a deliverer. The heavy burden of tax upon them so that they could expand their empire never let up. There were two classes of people. The elite, probably the top three or four percent, and everybody else at the bottom, no middle class. No hope of moving from the bottom to the top. The elite remained the elite, and those under them remained who they were. There was no hope. Time was not filled with hope in those days. It was actually hopeless. There was no thought of, my children will have a better life than I have, like you and I live with. The second thing is that there was this language, the Greek language. And the Greek language was a declined language, and it was just perfectly created for God to give exact details of who he is. Listen to this. Four words for love. Agape, you're familiar with agape love, the perfect self sacrificing love of God for us, that God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to die for us. Greater love hath no man than this, than someone would lay down a life for a friend, but he laid down his life for us when we were yet enemies. And so this Greek language was so great, phileo love, friendship love, stargine familial love. And eros, sexual love, so perfect was the language that the details of God's kingdom could be laid out for us. Different words for power and authority so that God could show us the difference between the two things. Power to do something is different than the authority to do something. And so he gave us a, a, a great language to tell us about him. The third thing um, that kind of grabbed my attention in all of this, why Jesus came, was the Jewish people at that time had built synagogues and temples, and they were claiming that there was a Messiah coming. And they were speaking it. And so there was already a religious organization, if you will, of the Jewish people to transmit the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so those three reasons perhaps had an effect upon God when he decided in, these, in this fullness of time, I'm going to send my son. At the heart of the Christmas story is a powerful truth that God is pursuing every one of us. I just want you to hear me this morning. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you went through this year. I, maybe you went through the, the, the terrible ordeal of someone you love leaving you by death because of the virus or whatever reason. But God is pursuing you this morning. I want you to know that. He's pursuing you. He's coming after you. He's trying to get your attention. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows where you're at. Paul goes on to say in Galatians 4 and 4 that we know God. And then in mid-sentence, he stops in verse 9. And, and this is what he said. He said, oh, but... Actually, I am known by God. There's a difference between knowing God and knowing that you're known by God. That means he knows your address. 
I mean, I'm just here to tell you this morning, he has not forgotten you. You may be walking through hell, but you keep putting one foot in front of the other, my friend, because he knows you. You are known by God. Known by God. The hairs of your head are numbered. He knows you. When we could not go to where God was, he came to us. It's a beautiful old song that I, I love so much. I don't try to sing much anymore, but boy, if, if, if this morning were one of those mornings where I could sing, I'd sing that song. When I could not go to where he was, he came to me. Can you, can, you just, can you just kind of get outside of yourself today and understand that he left heaven and he came to earth and if you'd have been the only one on earth, if you'd have been the only one with sin, if you'd have been the only one struggling, he'd have still come from heaven to earth. God influences, he intrudes, if you will, into our world at a given moment, at a given time. His life is bracketed by two impossibilities. Say impossibilities. That's an interesting word in the kingdom. Because in the kingdom of God, there is no impossibility. For example, in the kingdom of God, a donkey can be made to speak. An axe head can be made to swim. It's amazing what God can do. He can do all that. He can part the Red Sea. Make him walk across on dry ground. He's just an amazing God. He can have one man with the jawbone of a donkey kill a thousand Philistines. There are no impossibilities. But let me give you two impossibilities. A virgin's womb and an empty tomb. There can be no baby in a virgin's womb. And there can be no life from a tomb. But Jesus came and said, let me show you what I do with impossibilities. I step right into the middle of it and I create something. <laughs> he entered our world through a door marked no entrance. And he left through a door marked no exit. Hallelujah. Can I talk about two impossibilities? You say, oh, I've got an impossible situation. It's just impossible. Oh, no, 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 it's not impossible. You keep hanging on to God because you see with God all things are possible. All things are possible. A virgin's womb, an empty tomb, a door marked no entrance, a door marked no exit unexpected, unwelcome. He came as what I call the divine intruder. He intruded on our world. He stepped in. He was not welcomed by his own people. And what did he come to do? I love that song a minute ago. He's a turnaround specialist, you see. He comes into situations where people can't turn it around and he just turns things around. He just flips a switch. All things are better with Jesus. All we have to do is wait on him. We, we, we get so impatient with him. Where are you, Lord? He said, I'm right here with you. Actually, if you know me, you know that I'm living inside of you. <laughs> I'm feeling Jesus right about now. I said, I'm feeling Jesus right about now. I feel the presence of the living Father God in this place. <laughs> Unexpected and welcome. Turnaround specialists. What did he come for? He came to turn things around. He came to say there is a kingdom and I've come to show you the kingdom. I've come to reveal my father to you. Watch me reveal my father to you. Just watch me. Follow around. He gathered some disciples around him and had them follow him. And he took them from city to city. And, and when there was a need, like there was a need to pay taxes, he said, oh, that's, that's really not an issue. Peter said, you don't understand the Roman government. They're really mean people. If we don't pay the taxes, they're going to come after us. He said, Peter, you're just my man. Let me show you how the kingdom operates. I want you to go down to the riverbank, and I just want you to look there for a moment, and a fish is going to come swimming right up to you. And you're a fisherman. You know fish. Just reach in and grab that fish and Pop his mouth open, and there you're going to find the money for the taxes. What is he saying? He said, I got treasure all over the earth. 
I got buried treasure everywhere. People get so excited about these buried treasure things. I got a dear friend, Perry Stone. You know Perry. And Perry's always reading about these buried treasure. I think I know where it is, Tony. I, I, Perry, I don't, I don't know if you do or not. Oh, I, I think I know where that one is. It, go find it. Jesus has buried treasure. You're looking around in your world and saying, where's the substance? Where's my help? Where, where's the answer? He said, I got buried treasure all around you. I can show you. He said, come on, disciples, just follow me around a little bit. And, 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 he went, and, and, and here is, here's a man by the roadside, and, and, and the man can, cannot walk. And, 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 and Jesus said, would you like to? Do you, do you have a desire to? You, you, you think you might want to walk someday? Oh, oh, I don't have anybody to help me. I, oh, Jesus looked at him and said, your help arrived just now. Just, just look at me. Just look on me. And that man whose back was on his bed got up and put his bed on his back and walked on. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, boys, that's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. And then he found that person blind from birth. And his disciples, uh, uh, not asking the right questions. I, I don't think this would have been my question. Uh, Jesus, uh, why is this man blind? Did his mom sin? Did his dad sin? Why is he blind? And Jesus looked at them and he said, look, the only thing you need to be focused on here is not why he's blind, but focused on the fact that I'm about to open his eyes and he's not going to be blind. And he opened his eyes. Everywhere Jesus went, he was introducing the kingdom. He was introducing the kingdom. You know, in our world, and I'm a pastor, 46 years, same church, only church, left Lee University, went up there, 40-something people, and stayed there 46 years because Shirley and I don't, don't like moving I don't like moving because when Shirley would move, on the day we moved, we got it very early in the morning. Everything was packed. Truck came. We loaded everything up. We get to the new house, new apartment, whatever it was. Everything had to put, be put away by midnight. You didn't go to bed with a box. They had to be outside ready for the trash. You hung all the drapes. You hung the blinds. You put every dish in place. That was Shirley. Don't you leave anything on the counter, Tony. Did you leave anything on the counter? Did you turn on the dishwasher? I loved her. She was so, so specific with life. She loved life. I, if I were going to identify Shirley, if I were going to describe her to someone, I'd say simple elegance. That was her. That was the beauty of her. And so here we are, and Jesus comes to us in flesh. And he says, let me show you my father. Let me identify you with my father. I'm going to turn things around. Notice how he came. He came humbly. He came as an humble servant. He didn't come like a lot of people come today in the kingdom. He didn't have to be announced. As a matter of fact, if you're going to announce the birth of somebody, you don't do it like they did with Jesus. Jesus said, it's not about the announcement of who I am. It's about what I'm about to do that matters. He's the only person ever born in human flesh that got to choose his family. He's sitting with his father, and his father says, I'm going to send you down there. It's time. You're going to go down. You're going to walk around in human flesh, and you're going to live in a family. Which one would you like to go to? I know. You're looking at me like, where did you get that? In my mind. I mean, you get these pictures. and There are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit counseled with each other. Talk to each other. Which family would you like to be born into? And of all the families of the earth, he picks Joseph and Mary, and they're not married. Now, you and I would look at that and say, whoa, hello. If you've got your choice of every family on earth, and you're going to into the world to save the world from their sins, wouldn't you like to be born in a really powerful, influential family? Jesus said, I'll, I'll, I'll take Joseph and I'll, I'll take Mary. I'll, I'll choose that family. An unknown, poor carpenter. People talk about Joseph like he's some wealthy home builder. He was no wealthy home builder. Study his life. He's a poor carpenter. He didn't make a lot of money. They didn't even have enough money for the right kind of sacrifice. He couldn't even buy a lamb. They had to get two pigeons to sacrifice, poor man's sacrifice. When Andrew found out 
about all this in John chapter 1 and verse 46. He said, Nazareth? The Messiah is coming from Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That kind of tells you a little bit about what people thought of Nazareth. He chose his city. You know, I didn't get a choice to do that. I didn't choose Toledo. God chose me for Toledo. I mean, people are not standing in line to get to holy Toledo because it's not holy, you see. But he chose his family, poor parents. He chose his birthplace, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Such a beautiful name, such, a, such beautiful songs about Bethlehem. You ever been to Bethlehem? Oh, man. If you blink your eyes, you'll be through it. Just a small little unobscure town. Nothing really going on there. Reminds me of that story of the young missionary. He'd graduated and now he'd been sent to the mission field and he really wanted to make an impression and and he's going up into one of these third world countries and the only way to get there is so far by car and then you get off and ride a bike and then you have to walk the last 10 miles and he finally gets to the little gate of the city where old men sit around and discuss things. And there's an old man man sitting there. (laughs) And as the old man is sitting there, he never looks up. And the young man walks up to him and said, Hey, old man, any great men born here? The old man never looked up. He said, Nope, just babies. It's a slow joke. (laughs) Then we have to look at the lineage of Jesus. Have you ever read where he... His family came from? Have you looked how far back his family goes? Like, like, like for instance, if, if you go back in the book of Genesis and you read about Tamar, she, she, she's not a really uh, like influential, popular person. She, she's got some real issues. Uh, her, her husband dies and she gets the next son and, and then he dies, got, up, got upset with both of them because they didn't live right. I'm so glad we're not under law. I mean... You know, they didn't please God. And he said, I don't need you. So that's kind of a lesson for me. I want to please God. I want to be around for a while. Not, much, not as long as I used to want to be around. Tamar. She's been promised the third son by Judah. Judah means praise. But Judah's not so holy right now. His wife has died and he comes up into the village where Tamar is. She's upset with him because she's been waiting on that third son, the youngest son, to be her husband because that was the Levitical law. And it seems like Judah's not planning on giving her another of his sons because the first two already got killed. And he's thinking, I don't want to lose my third one. Must be something wrong with this woman. So she disguises herself, meets him in the gate, entices him and seduces him becomes pregnant. He doesn't even know it's Tamar, his daughter-in-law. And she has his baby. Fornication, adultery, for sure, sexual sin. Second one, quite interesting here. Her name is Rahab. She's from Jericho. She's a prostitute. Think about this. Say, where's all this? Matthew chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. And and Rahab is one of those people that somehow God chose to be in the lineage of Jesus and she greeted the spies and took care of them and hid them and saved their lives more than likely. Oh my goodness, she saved their lives. Hang a scarlet thread out the window of your home and when we come to take the city, you'll be saved. She's in the lineage of Jesus. Tamar's in the lineage of Jesus. Number three, Ruth. A lot of things we might not know about Ruth, but... Ruth was a Moabitess. That was a heathen country. They served the god Chemosh. Moab actually is interesting. He came from Lot's daughter by way of incest. And Jesus chose Rahab. And, and, and then, uh, uh, rather Ruth, and, and, and then Jesus chose Bathsheba committed adultery with David. Prostitute, incest, fornication, adultery. That's his lineage. He chose that. 
Why did he choose that? He said, I want every person on the earth, regardless of their status, to know that I was born from the lowliest so I could reach every man and every woman with the hope of the gospel. <laughs> Think about it. And then Jesus, Jesus, he chose a carpenter. He had to learn a trade. He said to the father, I think I'll be a carpenter. Chose his place of birth. Chose everything. Would I have been, if I'd been choosing, would I have choose those things? I, man, I'd looked at that lineage and I'd said, you know, there must be some better lineage here for me. That wasn't Jesus. He was never thinking about himself. He was thinking about you, about me. Until Jesus came, time was very empty. It was boring. It was depressing. Year after year after year, no improvement for the bottom, bottom 90-something percent of the earth's population. Same old, same old, same old. No hope, no light, no joy. And so when Jesus came, what did he do? He filled time with hope and joy and thoughts of heaven. He said, look, I'm, I'm going to turn this thing around. You, you've come through these monotonous years of boredom. I'm going to come and shake things up with my kingdom. And, and, and from the time of my birth on, I'm going to keep things shook up. He's still shaking things up. We, we still got people in this country that still get shook up by God. They're trying to take us one way and, and God's listening to the cries of the intercessors. And don't you ever forget that the intercessors still rule the day. And there are intercessors in this country right now crying out to God, God Almighty, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us because we as a nation have sinned against you, O oh God. Don't forget about us, Father. So what did Jesus do? He did the only thing that could be done with time. He redeemed it. He redeemed time. What does that really mean anyway? To redeem time. The word redemption in the New Testament is so powerful. In Paul's writings, the word redemption could mean location. He located us. Where did he find us? In the slave market of sin. He came and he found us. He located us. And what did he do when he redeemed us? He filled us with opportunity. He said, don't look at your position. Look at your potential. I'll say it again. Let me say it over here. Don't look at your position. Look at your potential. Don't you ever take your eyes off who you can be if you're totally surrendered to God. And always remember, every day you live not totally surrendered to God, you're missing out on your potential. Your kingdom potential. And so in the fullness of time, he came to redeem us, to locate us, to fill us with opportunity, to help us, to purchase us, to buy us back, to pay the price so he could redeem us. So here we are at the end of 2020, about to embark on a new journey of 2021. I don't want you to ever forget the words in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. Because you see, what that really means is when time had matured to a point that God could move. And when time matures to a point in your trial, your circumstance, your family, your situation where God can move, then a movement of God is coming. I stayed up here as long as I could. I'm trying. I know the lighting is better up there. My video people tell me all the time, don't go down on the floor. Buy new lights for heaven's sakes, I tell them. <laughs> I got to move. I got to move because some of you have been waiting on the fullness of time for your trial, your circumstance, your situation, and you've been praying and you've been living out your faith and you're wondering where is he? 
When's he coming? Oh, listen to me. That's not up to you. Remember, God said, I will not tell you when I'm coming. I'll just be an intruder. I'll just come at the least inspected moment. But here's what you need to be watching for. You need to be watching for him to show up in your trial, in your affliction, in your disease, in your circumstance, in your family. You need to be looking for God. In the fullness of time. Would you say it with me? In the fullness of time. My wife loved it as well. That was her thing. Right up until the last. Sometimes she would say to me, you, you need to pull this up on Facebook. Casey's singing. She'd sit up in her bed when she finally couldn't get up and she'd listen to music and preaching and teaching, Donnie. She loved Jesus. I thought he'd show up with a miracle, but he didn't. We didn't get it. But that's okay, you see, because she didn't die. Because you see, there is no such thing as a passage of death for the child of God. Because as fast as you can blink your eyes, you pass through it. Oh, I don't know if you heard me or not. There is no soul sleep. There is no place of death for the child of God. Just, as, just blink your eyes right quick. Just blink them. That's how fast you pass through death. She's alive today. I found out what they're doing up there. Actually, paradise is... I shouldn't tell them that because then if I tell them, I won't get invited back to tell them. So I shouldn't tell them. Paradise, Casey. Paradise. Paradise is Grand Central Station for the kingdom. It's where the throne of God is. It's where the seraphim and the cherubim it's where the four and the 20 elders are. Worship ceases not, night and day, never stops. And their angels are being dispatched to earth, continually carrying out the messages and the will of God on the earth. And they're very much aware of what we're doing down here. People. People always ask me, do they know what we're doing? Oh, yes, they do. I'll prove it to you sometime. They're aware. My granddaughter, Olivia, she's my oldest. Olivia, Bella, Mackenzie, and Abby, four granddaughters. Two for my son, two for my daughter. I love all four of them deeply. My, my granddaughter, Olivia, we call her the queen. She was the firstborn. She's at Karen Whedon School of the Ramp. She loves God with all of her heart. But she tattooed on her. Now, I know some of you sanctified people don't believe in tattoos. I understand. We tend to be not as sanctified in the north. But, but right there, she took her grandmother's handwriting and she tattooed it is well.
I, when I hear your team here, I, I hear angels singing. It's just like angels are singing that song. It is well, it is well with my soul. I don't know what your heartache in 2020 was. It will go down in my life as the worst heartache that I've ever known or felt. I lived most of my life preparing to live 120 years. That's what Genesis says. The days of man shall be 120 years. So I, 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 lived, I, I lived so that I could live 120 years. Harvard University did a study on the human body and determined that the organs of the human body are designed to live 120 years. So I wanted to claim those. So I watched what I ate. I exercised. I lived in the face of God. I get up every morning and the first hour is given to him. Seven days a week. I don't know what your year is like this year. And I, I, I know it's hard to do altar calls, but if it's been a real struggle and you're ready for deliverance, I want you to come and stand across the front. It's been a real struggle, Pastor. And, and maybe you're here and, and there's unconfessed, unforgiven sin in your life. You know, that's a really difficult place to be in. I have some unconfessed, unforgiven sin, Pastor. I know that I need to be forgiven. Or, you know, I, I, I didn't live as close to God in 20 as I, and I should have. I, I should have lived closer. Would you just come up here and stand with me? I, I, I kind of want to have a prayer with you. Today was a very difficult day for me because normally, Casey, she's sitting down on the front seat and she's praying for me. I never went anywhere to speak without her. She was my rock, my anchor. And the only reason I'm here this morning is her, her and Tony. It's the only reason I'm here. And I didn't come for all of you, but I came for somebody. Somebody's desperate out here today. Somebody's really tired of the same old, same old, and you've been praying and praying and praying, and God, I need you to show up. In the fullness of time, he's coming. He's coming. I got, I got time for you to come. Just, just a minute or two here. You know God's speaking to you. You know he's pulling on your heart. You know he's saying, come on, come on, come on, come on. Move, 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 move. A single mother sitting here, standing here today, a single mother, I hear it in my spirit, a single mother, you've struggled. You, it, it, it's like life isn't good and, and, and it doesn't seem like it's ever going to get better. God's speaking to you today, mom. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are, but he's talking to you. You need to hear him. He's saying, yes, I'm your answer and I'm coming Hang on to your faith. Don't give in. Don't give up. I'm here. He loves you. All of those of you that are here, look at my face, please. Just look up at me. Even if I, make, if I don't make eye contact, you, you keep looking at me. Please hear me. If you will live the rest of 20 and all of 21, believing in the fullness of time, he will come to me. Hell can't stop him from coming. You see, sometimes we give up too soon. Don't you give up. You're right on the verge of your answer. You're one prayer away from your miracle. On the worst day, just keep plowing through. People ask me, are you angry with God? Are you kidding me? You think I'm going to be angry with God? I'm not angry with God. I'm angry that she's gone. I'm angry that I don't have her. But I'm not angry with God. I'm not going to take on God. I, the world's enough for me. I mean, you know, I'm not that foolish. I love God with all of my heart. It did not diminish my faith one bit. I still pray for miracles. I still believe in miracles. We didn't get one. But the enemy will not steal from me the faith that God put in my heart to believe that his word, his word is still true. So you look at me, I'm going to pray for you. I just want you to stretch your hand out like this. I'm going to pray for you. Father, you see the hearts of these men and women standing here in front of me. I don't know who that single mother is that I just felt so strongly about a moment ago. I don't know what our struggle's been. I don't know what the struggle is of these people, but here's what I'm asking you, Father. Would you cause in the fullness of time, God is sending me his son. Would 
would you cause that verse to rise up inside of them this morning and cause them to take hold of hope because you came to redeem time, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sing just a little more of it. Stay right where you're at. Don't leave yet. I love when Pastor Tony said, a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. The declaration to Mary from the angel with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. You know, I was I'm in the midst of trying to finish a book that I thought I wrapped up right at the end of this at the beginning of this pandemic and it just keeps kind of shifting and changing but the heart of the book is taking out of 2 Kings chapter 4 where God gave people a promise in the midst of a famine and the Bible said this child was supernaturally given to this woman after they invested in the kingdom the Bible said one day this child that was given to them falls over dead the Bible said that the father brings the child to the mother. And the mother does something. She takes this child to a place that they created for the anointing. And she lays this child on the bed of the man of God, the place where the anointing dwelt. And the Bible said she looked at a servant and said, prepare a donkey and get me to the presence of God. And the Bible said when she got to the man of God that carried the anointing of God for that hour, the Bible said he sent word to her and asked her one question. How is it with you? How is it with your husband? And how is it with your child, the promise? I'm sure her heart was broken because she knew what she was walking through. Her husband devastated because the child died in his presence. And she knew the result of what was lying in the room. The child was dead. But she made a statement that I believe shift the heavens. And the Bible said it activated the anointing in the man of God to come to her house. She began to declare this, it is well. And this is what she knew. In the natural, it was a mess. In the natural, it was chaotic. In the natural, it was a battle. But something rose out of her spirit. And I'm just sensing it right now. I felt it in this message that some of you can't see it. Some of you do not feel it. Some of you can't grab hold of it. But there's something rising out of you that's declaring it is well. It is well. It is well. I'm about to step right in the midst of what God is doing. The fullness of time has come. We're going to sing this one more time. And I don't want you to sing it as a song. I want you to declare it as a declaration. I want you to declare it in the face of the adversary, in the face of the obstacle, in the face of the heaviness that is trying to destroy. I want you to just declare it in faith. And then Pastor EJ is going to come. Don't leave. If you're at home today, if you're traveling today, right where you're at, make that an altar and make this declaration together. And we're going to sing it. And we're going to believe that it's about to send angels. It's about to shift the heavens. It's going to cause something to begin to work in the moment of our situation. So right where you're at, if you feel comfortable, lift your hands, lift your hearts. Let's sing this as a declaration today. Come on, every voice. Sing as well.
Amen. What an incredible word today. Can we thank Pastor Tony Scott for being with us this morning and for sharing from his heart? Thank you so much, Pastor Tony, for being with us today. City Life, thank you so much for being with us. I want to remind you before you leave that our New Year's Day service is coming up. Dante Bo, Maverick City Worship will be with us. It's going to be an incredible night. Make sure that you register, whether you're in person worshiping online. We would love to see you here. It's going to be an incredible night. We pray that this last week of 2020 be the best one yet. We are anticipating God to begin to do some new things in 2021, but 2020 isn't over yet, and whatever God has been speaking to you, there's still time for him to do, amen? Amen. And so we are just so excited for everything that God has done in this year. Again, thank you for your generosity. You made ministry happen this year, and we are so thankful for that. City Life, let's pray together, and let's leave declaring that it is well in our souls. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for today. Father, we thank you for the word that was spoken into our lives. God, the presence that we felt in this place. Thank you for meeting us here. Father, I just pray today, God, that as we leave, Father, as we begin to get ready to step out of 2020 and into 2021, Father, that everything that we've walked through, God, God, that it's just that we've walked through it, and God, we've gotten through it because of you, and Father, we're ending this year declaring that it is well in our souls. Father, we love you. We thank you. We cannot wait to see what you're going to do in 2021, and Father, we just declare blessings in our lives. In your name we pray, and everybody said... Amen. City Live, we love you. Go with God as he goes with you. We'll see you on New Year's Day.